everybody. Let's sing the Lord. Here we go. I'm here. Christ be the center of our lives, be the place we fix our eyes, be the center of our lives. Will Christ be the center? Oh, Christ be the center.
Shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? Shall I fear? Oh, Lord. say whom shall I fear? My strong tower, yes, you are my hiding place, and I'll take refuge in who you are, because it's with you I find my peace. And so I'll sing. strong tower yes you are my hiding place what can I give to you for all that you've given to me I'll give glory
that's our desire, Lord, just to give you our whole life. And we know, Lord, that there's a cost to that, <clears throat> Lord. And maybe we haven't really counted that cost, but I pray that tonight as we look at the scriptures, see the stories of how you walked on this earth and what you did among us, I pray, Lord, that you'd shape that thought and that we'd know, Lord, what it means to follow Jesus. Help us with that, Lord. And I pray that you'd bless us with sharp minds, that we'd receive your word and that it'd bring forth good fruit tonight. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't you get all situated and we'll get started. All right. Matthew chapter 8 is where we are. So why don't you flip over to Matthew chapter 8. Good to see you all. Chance to get in the word. Uh, Matthew chapter 8. You know, it's good to know your Bible. I'm always amazed at people that claim to know their Bibles and quote the Bible. It's always horrific when politicians start qu quoting the Bible. Oh, man. But even Hallmark, even Hallmark, I remember uh, a few years, quite a few years ago now, but. Um, uh, there was this uh, Christmas card. It was beautifully ornate with the little picture of the nativity and the lamb on the shepherd's shoulders, that whole thing. And, um, and the, the script, there was a little scripture verse on there. They exchanged gifts and made merry, Revelation chapter eleven ten. 10. <laughs> now, some of you that are laughing, it's because you know the Bible. Um, uh, so this is the thing. They they, they, they took this verse, uh, Revelation eleven ten. 10, they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts to one another. And, you know, the Hallmark, you know, people probably Googled it and thought, oh, here's a Bible verse about giving gifts and making merry. So, Merry Christmas. Well, um, it, turns, it turns from Christmas to Halloween real quick. Um, <laughs> when you actually read the context of this verse, uh, this is in Revelation, it says, they, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Um, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over the dead bodies and make merry and shall give gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So the two prophets of Revelation are killed and left their bodies in the streets. So the uh, people of the world give gifts and make merry. Uh, it's not really a, a warm Christmas greeting, more of a Halloween kind of situation. It gets even more Halloween when you re read the rest of the story. The two dead bodies come back to life and say, we're back. Um, it's a whole other story of the Bible, but um, it helps to know your Bible. Uh, I always love working through the Bible. Um, and um, we're going through some of the fun, funnest stuff of the Bible, if you ask me, and the life of Christ. And even specifically, we've been kind of wading through the, the, in the book of Matthew, at least, the first there's kind of a grouping of 10 specific miracles that we've seen in chapters eight and nine, or we will see here. And we've covered the first several of these 10 specific miracles. Miracle number one, we saw the cleansing of the leper. Uh, chapter eight, verses one through four. Uh, and, um, and we saw, you know, how the Lord starts with the outcast, the repulsive, uh, the, 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 the people that nobody else wanted to touch. Jesus starts there, I love that the cleansing of the leper. And then we saw miracle number two. We saw the, the healing of the centurion's servant who was uh, sick of the palsy, as it turns out. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a little bit. But Matthew chapter eight, verses five uh, through 13 is that one. And then of course, the healing of Peter's mother-in-law there in miracle number three. We saw that as he went down into Capernaum uh, and healed Peter's uh, mother, uh, mother-in-law, and there she was also an outcast. All of them, a, a leper, a, a Gentile, a woman. Uh, Jesus is just 
caring for the people that nobody else cares about. That's what's kind of amazing about the miracles thus far. And, um, and so that kind of leaves us uh, still in Matthew chapter 8 in our study. And we left off right around verse 18 uh, in our previous study. So let's pick it up in verse 18. It says in verse 18, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. One of the things you and I should be sensitive to as we're reading the gospel narrative of Jesus is how many times he gets away from the multitudes, or at least seeks to. Um, you know, Jesus was pressed by the crowds, and, uh, and Jesus needed time away. He needed to take time to seek the Lord, to pray. Uh, he would get up early, uh, you know, and go up on the mountain and seek the Lord and, and then uh, be up there late at night or the middle of the night, oh, two in the morning. We're going to see Jesus very much taking time away. And I always kind of marvel, if Jesus needed that, how much more do you and I need that? This idea of getting apart and just focusing in and pressing in upon the Father, which is in heaven. You know, how many times, if you're, if you're you know, astute as a Bible student, you're going to see he, this is a big part of his whole ministry. We always think of him in the multitudes and miracles and the crowds, but Jesus saw the need to get away and makes me worry. You know, are we a bunch of busybodies? I think the answer is yes, a lot of us. We're busybodies, man. We're always going, going, going like the you know, Energizer Bunny. Um, you know, uh, and we're all, a lot of us are ruled by urgent things. Whatever's urgent comes your way. Oh, you gotta fix that, you gotta do that. You know, people come to you with questions or things you need to do or things at work or family issues. And man, a lot of people just kind of get run over by the tyranny of the urgent. And, and that's the problem. We have to be careful um, to not be ruled by that, but to actually, you know, actually plan it out. I think Jesus was very methodical. When you, when you actually look at Jesus's life and ministry, and I know he was there at Galilee and the, the pace of life is much slower there than it probably is here. But is that our own fault? that we've allowed our culture just to run over our schedule. You know, your schedule, your calendar, well, it's a great servant, but it's a horrible master. If you use your calendar as a servant, that's great. You know, you, you, you know, write it down and, and make time to seek the Lord and carve out time to pray and get away and, and read your Bible and stuff like that. You can, you can use the calendar as a great servant, but it's a horrible master. If you're ruled by your calendar, then you're, then you're doing it wrong. Um, you know, we live in a time where even if you're not on your calendar, you're on your social media. And people are on social media, you know, some people 24 seven, it's amazing how much time they spend and they're never really pulling away from it. They're constantly seeing what's going on in the world and what's going on with their friends and what's going on with the likes that they're getting from their entries. And, and people, you know, people are obsessed with this and some people are so obsessed it's ruining them. Um, young people are suicidal. There's, there's suicidal tendencies that come from these kids that are far too much on social media and they're comparing themselves with everybody else, at least the image that the other person presents on the other side of their social media, which is never really true. But how connected are we? We're so connected now. And, and you know, sometimes you think, wow, it's so convenient, but has it really been good for us to be so connected? Did you see that T-Mobile uh, phones are gonna connect now to Starlink for free starting next year? Um, uh, this is an interesting thing. Uh, Debbie and I and Tad and Marna, we were all sitting on the back porch uh, last summer. And um, we were kind of just, you know, sitting, and Tad and I were sitting over by a bonfire, and Marna and Debbie were sitting uh, kind of out looking at the stars. And Debbie said something like, oh, there's like 30 satellites going all at once. And I was like, yeah, that doesn't really happen. You know, Mr. Space and Outer Space Solar System, that's kind of one of my pet you know, hobbies, I love all that stuff. And usually you see a satellite or two, but you don't see like 30 of them. I'm like, I don't know. And I said, no, no, really, there's 30? Yeah, yeah, there's about 30 or whatever. And so Tad and I, we kind of rolled our eyes, yeah, whatever. So we walked over and looked up and there were 30 satellites just kind of. I'm like, what in the world? It looked like we were being invaded. Did anybody see that? Uh, see, okay, some of you have seen this. And what, I, I looked it up. I was like, I gotta know what that is. And I Googled it. What am I seeing in the sky tonight? All these you know, satellites. And as it turns out, Elon Musk was up to it again, launching satellite after satellite. After satellite. He, I think it, that night he had uh, you know, over 20 satellites going over our head right at the same time. Um, and it just felt weird, like this canopy of sa satellites going by. And, uh, and it almost felt like invasive, like, wow, there, there goes our night sky as we once knew it. You know, it's kind of interesting. Now, I am pro-tech, 
And I do like it. In fact, we here at AC Creek, we have redundancy in our internet connection because we, we live stream, we wanna have good connection. So we've got several options in case something else goes down. But one of those is we're with Elon, man. Here at AC, we got the Starlink and if our internet's down, we're gonna still be up. Uh, it's great. Uh, so <laughs> so um, I'm not complaining really, other than, well, with this T-Mobile thing, phones all over the world, you know, last time I was in Africa, I was out in the middle of nowhere, and even my African buddies, they all have cell phones. And they had these funny little things out in the middle of the bush. You know, they were these little solar panels on a metal rack with a car battery at the bottom. And they were, they were laying around everywhere. And missionaries brought those in. And I'm like, what, what, what are those? Oh, those, that's how we charge our phones. You know, there's no electricity out there. So, so they just hooked their phone up to the car battery at night, let it all charge up. And then the next day, the, the battery's recharged. And I was thinking, wow, that's kind of cool, except, man, suddenly people out in the middle of nowhere in the bush of Africa, they, they have access to the world of the internet. And that makes me sad, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's because the world of internet can be really evil. But sooner or later, we need to pull away from all that. Um, sooner or later, you need to take time away from technology in a way and rest and seek the Lord and pray. And um, I know that um, this might seem you know, crazy in our day. You know, we, we're, we're better connected and the quality of what we're seeing is better and better. You know, the speeds and stuff. I just saw this Japan, Japan set a new record and they bring the world closer to internet 100,000 times faster than the current speeds. Um, with this power, one petabit per second would mean that 10 million channels of 8, 8K broadcasting per second um, live coverage would be possible with no lapse at all. Um, that's 10 million channels of 8K, not 4K. That's the best, what's usually piping into your living room for the most of you. But 8K, uh, live coverage would be possible, which is kind of interesting. Uh, that makes me nervous. I, when we, when AC Creek started going more high definition, I'm like, man, I gotta lint roll my shirts now. Cause it's like, you know, it's like the cameras, we, you know, it's like, oh, don't look at the spot on my shirt. I, I maybe a little Taco Bell here. Uh, it's like, um, yeah, problem. Um, uh, high def is not good for some of us, um, <laughs> but, uh, but that's, that's scary. Anyway, all that to say, uh, yeah, we, um, we, we got to pull back from this stuff and, and take time away. D you know, do you have a place where you go? Uh, Jesus sure did. He had a place where he'd go away and get apart. One of his tactics when the multitudes were pressing is he'd get in a boat and cross in uh, over the, the Sea of Galilee. Um, and that, that's a good thing. Don't forget what the Bible says. You know, the scriptures are true yesterday, today, and forever. And the psalmist said, be still and know that I am God. Uh, some people don't even know God, I'm afraid, because they've never taken 10 seconds to be with God and to commune with God and to pray. Um, you know, be careful. Don't be the person where the Lord says, depart from me, thou wicked servant. I never knew you. Oh, but I knew my, I knew my social media friends. And I went to church and I watched online and I did this and that and the other thing, but you gotta know the Lord personally. And when exactly does your relationship with Jesus become personal? That's what you have to ask yourself. So take time, you know, focus in on the Lord. Jesus wasn't ruled by the urgent things. Um, by the way, you know, there's so many examples, we're gonna see this, where Jesus just kind of methodically goes and does what he's gonna do. Remember when one of his dearest friends, Lazarus, was deathly sick and they all ran, Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick. You gotta go help him right now. <clears throat> and Jesus waited two days. He, he sort of moseyed. And you know, it was only when they told him, it was only about a 15 minute hike from where he was to go to Lazarus where he was. But Jesus wait, waited two days. And, um, and you know, he, we know the way the story ends. Jesus was gonna do a truly great miracle in raising Lazarus from the dead. Um, but some of us, I think, are so busybody, too busy to uh, set time aside for the Lord and leave room for the Lord to do miracles in our lives. We're, we're busy making things happen. We're, we're busy, shockingly busy, uh, and uh, we're not leaving any room for the Lord. Watch out for this. Jesus, note that. Watch it. As we go through this gospel, these gospels, we're going to see him get apart um, uh, often. So that's what he's doing. We see that in verse 18, the multitudes thronging and he, uh, he gives the commandment to depart to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Verse 19, it says there, um, and a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee wherever, whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, the foxes have holes <clears throat> and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath not where to lay 
his head. What does that answer have to do with the scribe following him? Well, uh, as it turns out, kind of everything. Um, here, the scribe, interesting, the scribe was typically the enemy of Jesus, scribes, Sadducees, Pharisees. Those were the three major religious groups. Um, and this scribe's like, you know, he's, he's kind of taken in by this, you know, some of the miracles he's already seen, the healing of the leper, the healing of, you know, Peter's mother-in-law. We're seeing a lot of healing and stuff and blessing. So this guy's like, man, I'm on board. By the way, it's always interesting when I, um, I, I, I hope I don't offend anybody here because some of you may have said this to me, but after services, I, I remember for years, people, the people that come up the most excited and say stuff like this, I'll just, I'm just making this up. I'm not talking about anybody specific, but um, you know, they'll come and say, Pastor Brett, this is awesome. Man, count me in. I wanna be in leadership. I wanna be here. I wanna serve. I'm, count me in. I was at my other church and I did that and I'm gonna do that here and man, I'm in. And I'm like, great. And then I never see them ever again. That happens hundreds and hundreds of times over the last 20, 25, 27 years. And it's a funny thing. I mean, it's, it's kind of sad, but it's also kind of funny. Uh, now, probably have to be careful to, to not be skeptical when somebody comes up, Pastor Ben, I'm in. I'm like, sure you are. Like, uh, <laughs> we'll see about that, you know. Uh, but in a way, that's kind of what Jesus is saying here, uh, in, in that this guy's not really counting the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. He's saying, are you kidding? Really? I, I don't even have a place to live. Um, you know, foxes have holes and, um, you know, the, the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath not where to lay his head. So um, this guy wasn't really counting the cost. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, first of all, it means to be homeless uh, in this case, in this situation. And was this guy, did he even know really what he was talking about? And Jesus is trying to protect him from, from himself. Um, you know, it's interesting because following Jesus is harder than people kind of imagine sometimes. I think sometimes you and I sell Christianity wrongly. Hey, if you accept Jesus as your personal savior, your life will be wonderful. Um, and that's the way some pastors teach it, you know. Uh, you're gonna find the victorious you if you accept Jesus as your savior. But what, how do you explain that to the martyred Christians and Christians throughout the centuries that have been suffering and hurt and in pain, which is most of them throughout history? Uh, I can't guarantee your life will be rosy. In fact, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a promise of God's word. Um, and sometimes we have to remember that. Now, the reason we Christians tend to sell Christianity, hey, if you accept Christ, your life will be better. The reason is that's actually true, um, but it better in a different way. You might be persecuted. You might be uh, hated by your neighbors or your family members, and it's gonna be tough uh, to follow Jesus, but, but you know that heaven's coming. And you're living this life with the goal and the, and the anticipation of a wonderful heavenly future with Jesus. And that is better. Uh, being a Christian is better. It just may not seem like it at first. There's tough things that you go through. You gotta count the cost. As a, ba as a Christian, bad things still happen. Uh, the difference, by the way, when I, when I say as a Christian, bad things happen, you know what I've found is bad things happen to Christians and non-Christians. Everybody has bad things happen to them. Um, the question is, are you gonna do it with or without Christ? Are you gonna go through bad times with Christ or are you gonna go through bad times without Christ? And as a longtime Christian of 50 years, I would take bad times with Christ any day, any time. Christ is the way, Jesus is the answer. Um, you know, and that's, that's why we have to kind of sell Christianity carefully and rightly when we're talking about it. It's, this is that scripture I was mentioning, 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Uh, question, why do we follow Christ so that we can be comfortable and happy right now? Um, no, it's, it's, uh, it's because um, being followers of Jesus, first of all, it, it's the way, the truth, the life to heaven, eternal life through heaven. And living for Christ is what we're called to do. You were created for his pleasure. That's what the Bible says. And you and I will find our fulfillment in life when we follow Christ. But this guy who comes says, yeah, count me in, man. Uh, Jesus is like, I don't think you've really counted the, the cost on this. Um, and he starts off with, basically, I don't have a place to live. And are you ready to do that? Uh, live out homeless, basically, with me and my, my disciples. Um, now, uh, now, speaking of disciples, another thing we have to uh, kind of be careful about is um, when we read about the disciples, there's three main groups when you read the word disciples. The first, well, I should say, uh, there's several, um, there's layers. If you had to say what, what Jesus' closest disciple was, who would that be? John, right, it's John. Um, the one that Jesus loved, John was quick to point out uh, in his gospel, <laughs> which is funny. 
But then Jesus had an inner three. Who was that? Peter, James, John. Those were the inner three. Then you had the 12. Then you had the, anybody? 70. 70. And then you had the, anybody? 100. Somebody said it. 100. The reason I point that out is you have to kind of discern sometimes when you're reading the gospel narrative when it says, and the disciples, you, you might want to ask, oh, is that the three of them? or the 10 of the 12 of them, or the 70, or the 100. Like when they're offended by the, the uh, communion, when Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. Um, it's probably the 100. 100 of the main chunk of disciples left him at that point and said, yeah, we're not really into this, this thing that seems like cannibalism, we're out. And that was the greater group of probably 100. The 12 disciples were not offended by that, but the, the 100 were. So that's, there, there are some narrative there. And that's, that's where this comes in here in verse 21. It says, and another of his disciples, one of the greater, uh, bigger group, 70 or 100 probably, um, said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Now, is this just Jesus being insensitive? Um, does he not care <laughs> about this poor guy's dead dad? Um, and people misinterpret this all the time. It reminds me of the man <clears throat> who um, uh, was won a, won a contest and got a free ticket to the Super Bowl, and he was so happy. But when he got to the stadium, he found that his seat was up in the nosebleed section. And he's like, man, I can barely see the players. And so he kind of scanned way down, and there was an empty seat. And, you know, this is like the Super Bowl an empty seat down by the field, really close 50 yard line. And he's like, man, I wonder whose seat that is. So he thought, I'm just gonna go down. And he went down and, and uh, asked the lady sitting there and, and said, you know, hey, is, you, is anybody sitting there? She said, nope. And do you mind if I sit there? She said, no, go ahead. And so he sits down and he's kind of shocked that nobody, you know, nobody's got this seat. So, so the guy strikes up a conversation, man, who would leave a, a seat like this empty during the Super Bowl? And, and, the, and the woman answered and said, well, you know, this was my husband's seat. Uh, well, where is he? The guy replied, um, he died. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. Do you have anybody, didn't, why, didn't you have any family members? Like he waited a little bit and then, didn't you have any family members that wanted to come? No, well, where are they? Um, they're all at his funeral. Some people think that's what Jesus is saying here. Let the dead bury the dead, whatever. Um, <laughs> Dr. Adam Smith, who was a, uh, quite an authority on the Middle East, by the way, uh, and Middle East culture, has written several help helpful books on Middle Eastern culture. But he tells of one incident where he wanted to hire an Arab guide, and he explained that to the young man that, um, of this certain village, that he, you know, and he'd heard that this guy was an excellent guide around that region. So he asked the young man to be his guide, and the guy said, um, I would like to, but first I must bury my father. And there sitting next to him was his father. And he looked healthy as a horse. And, and Dr. Smith was like, what's going on here? And he realized the Arab really meant to say he would not leave because he would have to care for his father until he died. And the father was the son's responsibility until he died. And it was not culturally sound for him to leave when his father was getting older. That's a lot about what's going on here with Jesus in the Middle East. When this guy says, I need to go bury my father, his dad's probably not even dead yet. That was an, a, an idiom of the day. This man wanted to fulfill one of the oldest son's duties uh, to bury the father, and that is take care of him until he dies. And it kind of goes into the last thing. Remember, the last guy wanted to follow Jesus. And he said, man, you gotta first of all be homeless, uh, traveling ministry. Um, but he's like, well, I'd like to follow you, but I, I need to go bury my father first. Uh, it might be a few years before I can actually follow you, is really what Jesus is saying. Um, but uh, the, Jesus is making it clear, this would, if he was to follow him, it would mean putting aside that tradition of caring for your dad kind of to the nth degree. Um, now, when Jesus uses this sort of paradox, let the dead bury the dead, um, it's, it's, it's also a Jewish idiom that we're unfamiliar with, and it's not as heartless as it sounds. The word dead used in this passage is used in two different senses. Um, it's apparently a paradox, but, it, but it's used very effectively by Jesus. The Jews use the word dead often to um, express indifference toward a thing or something that has no influence over them. Uh, have you ever heard people say, you're dead to me? Um, it's kind of like that. Like, I, you, you kind of don't even exist. Um, Paul would employ this a couple times, this word dead. And this might help you with understanding what Paul was saying when he said stuff like dead to sin. 
Remember he said that? And he also said dead to the law. We are dead to the law. We're dead to sin. The idea is that sin has no more power over us. The law, we're no longer under the law. So we're dead to the law. And, and we Americans, we hear that. And go, what does it mean to be dead to the law? Well, the idea is uh, indifference towards something or even expressing that it has no influence or power over us. Jesus was basically saying, let the dead bury the dead. Um, um, you know, uh, not being uncaring, but spoke more about greater responsibility. Follow me. And when your father dies, you might even, you might even be able to read into this. I, this might be too much, but I'm, I'm trying to help us see this. You might be able to read in that you know, when your father die, dies, then you can go tend to him. But let the dead bury the dead. Um, uh, sometimes, by the way, um, we create a false dilemma. Uh, I'm going to go d- bury my father for the next couple of years, then I'll follow you. It's this or that. But sometimes it's not this or that. I'll follow Christ, but I need to finish high school first. If that's you, don't do that. It's not this or that. You can follow Christ and go to high school. And you really should. It's a great way to go. Or, you know, uh, I'll follow Christ, but I need to, you know, get married. And then when I get married and have kids, it's funny how we put off following Christ. And that's what this guy's temptation is. Well, I've got family stuff to deal with and I got to take care of my dad. So when that's over, I'll follow Christ. And the, the point that we kind of learn here is don't delay in following Jesus. Um, following Jesus for us means um, right now. Uh, don't, don't admit today is the day of salvation. And so, um, so now we get back to the 10 specific miracles here in chapter eight, uh, as we kind of have these little guys, these narratives of these guys wanting to follow Jesus, but they're learning to count the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. So, so far we've seen the healing of the leper, healing of centurion servant, healing of Peter's mother-in-law. Now miracle number four, we come to the calming of the sea in Matthew chapter eight, verse 23. It says there, and when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there rose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. <laughs> now, now this is great. Uh, uh, let, let's see a show of hands. How many of you guys have been to the Sea of Galilee? Raise your hands. Okay, that's a lot of you. That's great. I'm going to say one-fourth of this group. That's great. We need you all to go sometime. Uh, it's, it's, it's great. Okay, of those of who those went and saw the Sea of Galilee, when you drove down from probably Mount Carmel area and you came by the cliffs of Arbel and you dropped down in and you saw the Sea of Galilee, what's the first thing that came to your mind? Anybody? Small. <laughs> Somebody said it. That's the first thing, everybody, especially from the United States, we just go, the Sea of Galilee? Really? That's a mud puddle in Oregon. <laughs> or, or in the United States, like that's, that's not. Now, um, <laughs> now there's some things I wanna do, and, and I, I, I have to be careful because I love the Sea of Galilee, and I love the biblical narrative, but I also wanna be realistic. And one of the things that the biblical uh, translators over the centuries really, some of the oldest, like the King James, I, I'm going to be rough on the King James here for a second, is a lot of times in 1611, people like to use hyperbole and sometimes let it sneak into their translation. Um, and this is one of those stories because we're reading, so far, what are we seeing? Um, verse uh, 24, there rose a great tempest in the sea um, in so much that the ship was covered with waves. So, you know, all of us in America were thinking, okay, this huge sea and 50 foot waves with the Queen Mary just kind of, you know, that's kind of what we're picturing. But uh, if you go to uh, the original language, there's some things you should know. Um, like, for example, the word sea here in the Greek is actually the word lake. It really is lake. If you look it up in your, in your definition of your dictionary, there's the, first, the first definition is a generic collective term for any body of water. Um, the second definition is lake in most of your Greek dictionaries. Um, so uh, that's one of the things, before you go to Israel, lower your expectations as this giant sea. It's actually a bit, you know, you might say it's a big lake or a medium-sized lake. If you're from Montana, it's a tiny lake. Or if you're up from the Great Lakes area, it's a microscopic lake. Um, but yeah, a lake, you know, you know it's, it's really a, a, a nice lake. Like we have here in Oregon, we have several nice lakes 
that are a similar size as the Sea of Galilee and what have you. But um, so, so that's kind of an important thing. Translators would sometimes use hyperbole um, because it's the Bible and it's the story of Jesus and we wanna make it sound more grandiose somehow. But um, I would say it this way, you don't need to puff air into the story of Jesus. Um, Jesus' stories are amazing the way they sit. And whether it was a big sea or lake. Now, um, uh, I wanna show you um, another thing, the word ship uh, there. Uh, the word ship, uh, it's not, as it turns out, the Abraham Lincoln or, uh, <laughs> or some big aircraft carrier. It's actually a, what we would call a dinghy, maybe, or a boat, mid mid-sized fishing boat on the Willamette River, uh, maybe. Uh, and that's something that you have to kind of look, look for, forward to uh, when, you, when you go to Israel. Um, let me show you some video of, uh, of our, our, some of our tour over there in Israel. This is always fun to go out on the boats on the Sea of Galilee. This is what all tourists do. Um, we get to go on this boat and take off from near Capernaum uh, and um, all the Athe Creekers, we go out there and we get into the scriptures and it's just a fun time. And even the boats kind of look biblical. And, and you know, maybe you're thinking even those boats, that's what Jesus was in, right? Something about that size, not even close. If you go to um, Nafginosar Kibbutzim uh, there um, at Nafginosar, there's a, a boat that they found back in the 80s. This is a great boat. Um, this is a model of that boat, but they found it in the water when the Sea of Galilee was really low. And there it is. Uh, it took them a long time. They actually carefully, when the water was low, they cut this boat out of the mud and they got the nails in it and everything that, that put it right into the very first century, the same time of Jesus is when this boat was, uh, they call it the Jesus boat because it was from the first century. Jesus could have been in this boat at some point. And there, when you see how tiny the Sea of Galilee is like, well, there's probably like eight or 10 of these boats around the Sea of Galilee. Like it wasn't, they had thousands of boats, but we get to go in there and see this and, um, and it's, it's kind of deteriorated uh, from its original, but it's 2000 years old for crying out loud, um, which is kind of fun. So, um, so this first century fishing boat is pretty much what they believe is the typical boat of the time of Jesus. Um, and so that's something to kind of uh, remember when you're reading about the great ship uh, of the New Testament, it's actually a boat. And I want you to kind of set your uh, expectations on that. Um, now, one thing that's kind of funny about this boat, when they found it back in the 80s, uh, they, they, the the Nof Guinness are uh, kibbutzim put up, there's a nice little store and a place to shop here and you can see the boat. But the Pope came uh, back in the 90s uh, to see this. And, um, and the, the Catholics have a way of kind of taking things that are biblical or places, locations, things. And the Pope said, you guys have the obligation to give this to the Catholic church. Um, and, uh, and the people of the Nof Guinness star uh, kibbutz that do this, um, they actually said, mm, no. And they gave them a key to the city, a little gold, little golden key and said, here's a golden key, but you can't have our boat. Um, so it's kind of cool that they kept the boat and you can go see it. And there's not a spaceship built over the boat, um, which is great. Now you say, okay, Brett, so we, we got the sea, we've got to set expectations, which is really a big lake. Um, you got the boat, which is not the Queen Mary. It's actually a boat, maybe uh, 20 feet, 25 feet. And putting picture 12, 15 guys in there, uh, you're pretty loaded. You're pretty loaded down in an old boat. Um, and, uh, and then you also have a great tempest. What's the tempest? Well, the word tempest is kind of an interesting word. Um, and uh, how does this work? Well, as it turns out, this is something I've seen with my own eyes. Even though it's a lake, it does have storminess on it. I've been there where there were maybe four or five foot swells. And if you're picturing 12 guys in this boat in four or five foot swells, then yeah, you would be scared especially if you didn't know how to swim. And, and the Jews are notorious for being fearful of water, even to this day. Have you ever noticed how the, the Israelis have almost never had a navy throughout all their history? They've got a small navy now, but it's like the brave few that will sign up because nobody wants to be near the water. Um, but um, when you go to the Sea of Galilee area, we, we, um, we cover ground here. And I've, I've kind of hiked all over this region uh, over the years. And uh, one of the, th this view up here is from the Cliffs of Arbel. And you can look down, see the little valley there that shoots out toward the Sea of Galilee? That, there's, there's some interesting dynamics that take place when you're going around this region. And that is from the north, the wind comes up by these cliffs. And these cliffs cause there to be sort of that Venturi effect 
on the wind. The wind's kind of blowing pretty good, but when it gets narrowed down through the canyon, it shoots a bolt of wind across the Sea of Galilee, which causes kind of amazing level storms in such a small sort of lake. Um, by the way, this, this cliff that you're looking down, you're looking down to where almost all the gospel happened right there. All the gospel happened at the foot of this cliff. All of the little towns there, that's where the whole gospel, like 70%, 75% of the gospel happened in that little shot. So when you stand on the cliffs of Arbel, you're just kind of looking at the gospel where the Sea of Galilee is. The cliff, if you drop, it's like 1,500 feet down. It's pretty, pretty. It, it's hard to tell from the pictures, but it's pretty high and kind of beautiful. But, but all that to say, um, the, the region here causes there to be big storms on the Sea of Galilee. And I've actually seen these uh, happen when I've been there. Uh, and they're, they're pretty big. Um, all that to say, the word tempest uh, is the interesting Greek word seismos. Does that sound familiar? Uh, where we get our word seismic um, uh, and the shaking, a commotion, seismic. So that's the word being used. It was a shaking of the boat and a quaking of the boat uh, because of the storm. The reason I go into all this stuff is because you'll hear the critics and the cynics of the Bible talk about the exaggeratory nature of the New Testament. And um, I don't have a problem with, with uh, that argument. Um, I understand that in the translation, the King James particularly, I think, is it the NIV that calls it a lake? Yeah, the NIV did it right there, uh, as it turns out. Uh, it is a lake, uh, and that's what the word means. But uh, your King James and other translations still call it a sea, the mighty sea. Um, let me give you another expectation. Uh, we always load up for this one as we're driving in the bus near the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we get ready to cross the Jordan River. I said, okay, get ready, everybody. We're going to cross the mighty Jordan River. And everybody's like, oh. And they're thinking, okay, like the Willamette, the Columbia uh, River. And then we go across what you and I would call a crick. Uh, it's a little tiny crick. Uh, as you're driving over, and it's like 10 feet wide and uh, four feet deep, and it's kind of grassy. It looks a little bit like the Tualatin River um, uh, on a good day. Uh, that's the Jordan River. Uh, so anyway, setting expectations. Uh, but, um, but all that to say, um, Jesus was sleeping at peace during the storm. I love this. Oh, that we might be more like Jesus. We always say, oh, make me more like you, Lord. I want to be like, what would Jesus do? He's asleep. Um, you know, when, when, the, when the storm is raging in your life, man, that's the person who's got it dialed is when they learn to be like Jesus. Say, you know what? I'm trusting so much in the Lord that he's got us and he's taking care of us that I'm, I'm chill. I'm sleeping. I love this. Uh, we forget that about this story. But, um, but then, uh, you know, the disciples come freaked out. They still don't know. This is early in Jesus' ministry. They still really don't know who Jesus is fully but they're about to find out. I'm wondering if this moment, I mean, the healing miracles were pretty cool, but this is the one where you almost get a sense that the people are like, uh, what are we dealing with here? You know, the healing of a leper, healing of Peter's mom, not like a fancy doctor or somebody who knows stuff or is able to heal miraculously, that's all great. But, but check this out, it's, it's verse 25. And his disciples came, you know, to him saying, awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, why are you fearful? Oh, ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Do you get that sense? Like, uh, this is next level. Uh, sure, the healing things are cool, but he just told the wind to stifle and it just stopped and the storm's over. Like, like this is a big deal. And, and Matthew, by the way, one of Matthew's things is he's giving us these stories to show Jesus's credentials. That's one of Matthew's as the tax collector, the recorder of the group. I think Matthew, one of his things is to record uh, who Jesus really is and his power. Uh, reading through the same story in Mark and, and Matthew, you pick up different stories and different details. And I think each gospel has its own purpose. We're going to go into that probably a little more as we get further into Matthew. We'll do more of a comparative study of the Gospels. But like, for example, in Mark, we learn, uh, Mark 4.35, it says the same day when the evening was come, he said to them, let us pass over to the other side. See, this is something Matthew doesn't really say, but that's where when Jesus says, why do you guys have so little faith? Um, and, and you say, well, come on, Jesus. Uh, these guys are fishermen. They're professionals. And it's a big storm. Don't they have reason to be afraid? And they, they do. I mean, you and I would say, yeah, of course they're, they should have a reason to be afraid. But, but Mark's gospel says, let us pass over to the other side. 
Um, when, when he says that, um, it makes me wonder, you know, did they, did they lack faith? Because Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side. This is where they're learning to trust Jesus. They have to learn when Jesus says, we're going to go to the other side. They're learning that they have to kind of say, well, okay then. Or storm, no storm. We're going to get to the other side. Um, do you remember that whole saying um, of God's commandments are his enablements? When God commands it, he gives us the ability and enables us to do it. And so when Jesus said, let us pass to the other side, they could have, and it's easy in 2020 hindsight, it's easy to say, well, they should have had faith. Um, but I give them a huge break because I would have been right there with them, probably freaked out. But Jesus is teaching them. That's why he says, um, you know, why are you of such little faith? Um, you know, he, he basically said, I, we're gonna go to the other side. So you need to learn to trust me is kind of what's happening. So then he rebukes the sea and there's great calm and everybody marvels. Um, I love that. So that, that's, that's miracle number four of our 10. Now, keep in mind, this is just Matthew's accounts of these 10 miracles. There's, there's a lot more. And even Matthew implies of the many other miracles. But that brings us to miracle number five out of the 10. Uh, here, casting out demons. Uh, it says here in verse 28, and when he was come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him saying, if thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city and told everything that was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And the whole city came out to meet Jesus and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. We looked at this on Sunday and I called that sermon deviled ham uh, <laughs> because uh, we got these pigs that were, you know, uh, possessed by all these legion of demons. And we went over all that. And, and um, you know, one of the things that we need to remember is the differences. And we talked a little bit about this. And if you missed Sunday or Saturday's teaching, um, you might want to go back and pick that up because, or, you know, go online because we covered this whole in, whole thing in better detail. But but I, I also want to remind you that Mark's account of this sounds very different. And like I said, don't be freaked out by what people call contradictions in the Bible. Um, either it's two separate stories or, and they were very similar, or it's the same story from different perspectives. Um, different perspectives. I, I'm learning to, as I get older and older uh, to give way for different perspectives and realize that they're legit. Um, you, you married couples know. Um, you know, how many of you married couples, if I got you in a room uh, and, and said, okay, here's a pad, a pencil, write down how you met your husband, how you met your wife, and how you fell in love and that whole story. Um, I'm pretty sure your stories are gonna be very different. Uh, <laughs> some, I see elbows fly, and it's like, that's you. Uh, yeah, you, we remember things differently. And it's from a different perspective. Uh, it's not that one's worse than the other, or even they're, one of them's wrong. It's just that they're different perspectives. In the same way, the gospels do tell the story from different perspectives, and we should stay calm and not worry uh, about that. But um, one thing we kind of looked at on Sunday that I want to remind you of, because it's going to come into later play, is the doctrines concerning devils. We, we sort of learned some stuff uh, on this weekend. Uh, demons are not atheists. That's number one. Uh, they believe. Uh, remember they said right here, you know, uh, the devils talked to him, Jesus, thou son of God, are you come hither to torment us before the time? So the first thing we saw is demons are not atheists. Um, but their belief is not saving belief. And we talked about the difference between saving belief versus just believing. It's, do you believe Jesus or do you believe that he exists? There's a difference. And the believing Jesus, what he said, who he was, what he did, that's the John 3, 3 16 belief. Whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The word believe there is to lean on, trust in, to believe everything he said and did. The demons believe that he exists. And, but, so that's kind of important. But demons, as it turns out, are not atheists. Uh, James chapter two, verse 19. Um, he said, thou believest that there is one God, 
uh, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. He, he's saying, you know, you know there, there's something that's required more than just saying, I believe that God exists. That doesn't get you anywhere. Even the devils believe that. Uh, so that's kind of an important thing. Number two, demons are doomed. We learned that. And they know it. They know that they're doomed when they say, are you coming to torment us before the time? Uh, they know there's an appointed time when they, uh, the demons, the devils, and the devil himself, Satan, are going to be done away with. That time is coming. And I look forward to that time. Um, and then number three, demons can possess people. Uh, um, and that's, that's something we see in the Bible. Um, question, can demons possess Christian people? No, that's important. There's a lot of weird theology out there that, and they, they talk about the demon filling me and doing all this stuff. And that's just a bunch of heebie-jeebie people that don't really know their Bibles. If Christ is in you, uh, dark and light can't coexist. If Jesus is in you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you have Christ in you, there's no way Satan will possess you. Um, now, Satan can um, mess with you, um, but he can't possess you. That's a different, different thing. Uh, I see Christians not possessed, but I see them obsessed. Have you seen Christian obsession, de demon obsession, where that's all they're talking about? I remember when I was a kid, this book came out. What was it called? This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti. Maybe you guys remember that. It was huge. And it was really intriguing. It was an interesting story and it was very, you know, uh, it got everybody's attention, but it gave everybody this new found awareness of demons in the spirit realm. And, and in some ways there were probably some good things about that because people need to know what, don't you know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness. Like we should be aware that we're in a spiritual battle. And, and so that book did help that, but it also helped with the demon obsession. I remember there were people that took it too far and there was a demon around every corner. And they'd walk out, oh, my back hurts. I must have the, the demon of backache, you know? Uh, and we saw that and it got really weird. So uh, I always watch out for the bandwagons when we see those come and go in Christianity. Well, um, so demons can in fact possess people. Um, and you, some of you say, well, what about the pigs? I, I have to say this now, now for you that live in Texas, Florida, um, other countries, here in Portland, I've got to address this. What about the poor pigs? <laughs> Our brethren. Like the Westland article, the Westland tidings, you know, the woman that was chiding against pastors because we need to start preaching more about our persecuted brethren. I'm like, who, who's that? And they said, our, our brethren, the animals, and we need to stop eating them, you know, because they're our brethren and they're, they're, they're as important as people. And, and she made this huge argument. And as it turns out, the Bible says that, the, that animals are not as important as people. I know that hurts some of the Portlandia people here uh, that are maybe, if that's you, uh, some of us are like the best animals are on our plate uh, uh, or we're okay with that. But um, as it turns out in Matthew chapter 10, this is the heart of the Lord, by the way. This is something that maybe you guys that like your ribeye steak a lot, we have to kind of be careful because true, the Lord Jesus says, are there not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father, uh, but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Um, funny, because there's environmentalists today that would say the snowy plover is more important than a human. And I've told stories about that. I won't go into that again. But uh, remember the spotted owl, uh, you know, that knocked logging out of Oregon, which was really tragic. Uh, I could, don't get me started on that one. Um, Oregon never, just fly over Oregon. You'll see how many trees we have. We got a lot of trees. Um, and man, we used to pay for schools with trees. Now we do it with gambling and lottery and taxes. And it, it's just not as good as it was back in the good old long. Fires, all the fire. Well, don't get me started. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, you know, as it turns out, people are more important than animals. And that, that's, that's a, a biblical worldview. I hope you understand that. But still the Lord loves animals and cares about animals. And he sees that when a bird falls from the sky, he notices this. Um, the Bible says. So it's not to be cruel to animals, but at the same time, this whole movement. And, and you, you, you know, you guys that are in Florida or in Texas that are listening, you're thinking, well, I'm glad I live down here and we don't care about that. But interesting, there's something that's coming globally. And Bill Gates, you know, he's trying to make that fake meat and stuff. And uh, there's all the, what, what, what does he call it? It's like, <laughs> this looks horrible. Anyway, um, but yeah, it's like bologna, but it's, there's no meat in it. Uh, it's like a plastic version of spam or something. But, um, but, um, but the Bible says, 
uh, one of the things Paul told Timothy is in the last days, they're gonna make people abstain from marrying. We're seeing that start to happen where, you know, gay marriage and, and all this uh, transgender, TG, you know, all the, uh, the, the, the issues of marriage, around marriage. We're seeing people really hate the traditional idea of marriage. We're seeing that in the world. But I remember reading when I was a kid, they'll forbid people to marry. And I go, I wonder what that's gonna be like in the last days. And then also they'll, they'll make people to abstain from eating meats. And I used to think, well, how are they gonna do that? Like, you're, you know, um, and we're seeing that, like that's coming. Uh, in the Bible prophecy, we're seeing how people are starting to say, yeah, we gotta stop, you know, killing cows because the cows and cattle rent franching causes flatulence and the methane gas is destroying the world. And, you know, AOC is trying to figure out how to capture the methane coming from cows. They're, true story, I'm not making this up. There's these little tanks these cows walk around with and every time, you know, the cow does its thing, it's like collects the gas and they're trying to reharvest that. Pretty soon you'll be, you know, driving, you know, cars fueled by cattle flatulence. <laughs> Sounds perfectly logical. Um, but I digress. Jesus ate meat, so I eat meat. And so uh, we, we're not gonna fall for that, that whole thing. But, um, but as it turns out, the demons went into the pigs. And um, why did Jesus let them go into the pigs? And we talked about one reason is demons seem to not wanna be disembodied spirits. But, um, but I also wonder, uh, there's something I didn't mention on Sunday that I'd like to mention maybe tonight, is the demons... Um, what, what is their objective? I wonder if they had a strategy on that. Uh, they're gonna go down somehow. They're gonna go down as going to the pigs. They're gonna run down the cliff and fall in the water and drown. Um, why would they do that and what's in it for them? I wonder if maybe their tactic was to say, I wonder if we can get the townspeople of Gadara or the Gergesenes to not like Jesus. And if we take their pigs and kill them in the water, um, then they will reject Jesus. And I don't know if they're that smart, I don't know. But if they are, mission accomplished. Um, the demons were able to make the people of the Gergesene say, yeah, Jesus, get out of our town, we don't want you. They rejected Jesus because of their pigs. So I don't know, maybe these demons are smarter than we, we even know, or maybe not, don't know for sure. But basically what we saw is these people of the Gergesenes, the Gadara, uh, people of Gadara, they were people of compromise. And we saw the three big compromises that they were making through history. Well, that brings us to uh, Matthew chapter nine. Uh, and we see number, miracle number six. We see Jesus healing the sick of the palsy, as it's said in the Bible. Let's read uh, uh, chapter nine, verse one. And he entered into a ship uh, and passed over and came into his own city. So it seems that maybe he went back to the other side uh, where Capernaum, where he was staying with Peter and the gang. It uh, could be there. And behold, uh, it says, uh, verse two, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, um, this is interesting because you guys might know this story uh, in Mark's account. Again, Mark and Matthew give different perspectives. Matthew leaves out some fun details in my opinion, but, but he's, he's just accounting for Jesus's credentials, which he does a great job of that. Mark fills in some of the details. Some of you are more detailed people. This is the same story from Mark where four guys, there's so many people crammed in the house where Jesus is, four guys go up on the roof and pull off shingles of the roof and start lowering their buddy down into the house. Um, I mean, this is an amazing story. I love that story. Um, can you imagine Jesus teaching there in the house all of a sudden like sawdust and junks falling from the ceiling? I know what this feels like, by the way. I probably shouldn't tell you the story, but I think I will. Um, <laughs> I've done a lot of weddings and um, uh, over a thousand weddings in my day. Um, and uh, one of the... I got a lot of wedding goof, goof uh, mistakes and stuff. But, um, you know, veils catching on fire. I've got people uh, splitting their heads open and on rocks and stuff. And 
But, but this was one of the top ones, I think. I was, at, I was at this place called Gray Gables. Some of you guys know where it's at. It's a very nice, high-quality wedding place, you know, uh, fancy. Uh, and, um, but this particular wedding, I, I, I showed up in my suit, and, and I was ready to do the wedding. And the, 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 these wedding coordinator ladies, I, I'm not sure if they were from the place or, or somebody hired these really. Like, these were, these were crazy-level wedding coordinator ladies, like, like, like eight of them. And they all had their outfits and they had their earpieces. They looked like security, you know, and they had the little wires and everything that went around. And, and I got there, this lady says, okay, pastor, um, this is your microphone. Whatever you do, like this is how tense she is, make sure and turn your mic on. Now you have to understand, I turn my mic on only 10,000 times. Like this is something I do all the time. And I, in a thousand weddings, not only do I turn my mic on, I have a specific time where I like to turn my mic on, and I'll tell you what it is. Uh, it's when the back door opens or whatever, and the bride appears, then what everybody does is they look back at the bride. That's when I flip my mic on, because it's a good time to kind of do it with nobody noticing, and now you're gonna be, you've got a wedding on. <laughs> I'll be flipping my mic on. But anyway, so, so I, I flipped my mic on, just like she said, and she was like really crazy, like level, make sure, I, I guess pastors must have forgotten to do it before or something. But anyway, I turned my mic on, then, you know, the bride came down, and then I said, you know, who gives the bride to be, you know, and I asked the question, but there was no sound coming from my microphone. So I quickly reached down and made sure, with feeling, to make sure that the mic was on, and I, and I even kind of glanced down and saw, yep, the light's on, the green, you know, and then it's red when you have the mute button, so I was just, you know, I'm pretty familiar with it. Um, but I, I just kept going, and there was no sound, I was, and I was thinking, well, something else is wrong, you know. And pretty soon, as I'm doing this wedding, I get the bride and groom up, and I start, you know, May we can go together today. Twice on your wife. You know, that whole thing. Um, <laughs> sorry, Princess Bride reference. <clears throat> but but I, I, I was doing the wedding, and, um, and all of a sudden, these ladies are going nuts. Uh, there's, there's a lady with a sign, big sign, turn your mic on. And, and I, and I'm, I kind of tried to give her a nod. You know, I, I was talking, like, you know, and she just... She, like she couldn't have hold, hold the sign more intensely. Um, but uh, nothing happened, still didn't have mic sound. Uh, but I just, you know, I have a pretty big voice, so I was just talking loud. There's probably, you know, 150, 200 people, so it was, it was working out. But, but um, then I saw, true story, there was a lady, one of the ladies in her outfit with her. She's literally G.I. G. G. Joe crawling, like under barbed wire, <laughs> down the aisle. Like right here. She's like crawling, you know, knee to elbow, knee to elbow. <laughs> And, and she gets right here. And I'm sitting there doing the wedding, and I'm looking at her, she says, turn your mic on. <laughs> and it was getting to be where, like, the crowd was looking down at this lady on the ground, and it's like, um, so I had to, I, I finally said, um, just, just a heads up, my mic is on, just, you know, um, you know, but um, I, I, actually, I gotta go back, I'm telling something wrong. There were no lights on this particular mic pack. I like this mic pack because there's lights to test the batteries and stuff. This one just had a switch. It was just a simple switch. Um, so I didn't really know for sure, but I did double check the switch and all that. But anyway, long story short, they just start, they, they, she, she backs off back down the thing. And I can tell she's mad. And then, and now we're, we're doing this wedding under this beautiful gazebo thing. And, and the gazebo's here and this roof and these pillars. And then behind us is kind of this other building. And I don't know what's going on. But all of a sudden, I'm not kidding, I hear this, And then, I'm not kidding, sawdust started falling on my head and the bride's head and the groom's head. Like, and and um, I'm not kidding, a three inch hole saw, this guy's with his drill motor, up, he's up in the attic of the gazebo, drilling a hole through the, I think it was kind of a sheetrock that was there, but he's drilling a hole, it's a three inch hole. And I'm standing there doing this wedding and all of a sudden this, this little piece drops out. <laughs> And you know she's getting the white sawdust and stuff all over her veil and stuff, and 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 I'm not kidding. Then a microphone comes down. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd have no idea how much I had to risk, resist at not saying, "Are you ready to rumble?" Like I, I wanted to. I, I didn't say that. Oh, sorry. Um, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't say that, I resisted that, but um, <laughs> it was tempting. So anyway, I, um, 
So after the sawdust and all that, we finished up the, the wedding and they got married and it was great and everything. But after I, you know, I said man and wife and they all you know, went down, the team of ladies came up and they were just furious, furious. And they're like, you just are such a loser pastor kind of thing. And um, so I, I took the mic pack off and I, I looked and opened it up. They forgot to put the batteries in the mic pack. There was, there was no batteries, zero batteries in the pack. <laughs> and I, I, just, I just said, boy, I wished I, I wished I would have done better. I'm really sorry. You know, I was trying to own, but you know, you try to own something and it was so embarrassing. But, um, but I don't know why I told you that story. Oh, the <laughs> sawdust. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We need to get back to the Bible here. <laughs> Can you imagine being Jesus, you're teaching, and all of a sudden sawdust is like coming on your head and you're like, uh, hello, where are the deacons? Where's security? Um, but, but but it's amazing because Jesus sees the effort that these guys are going to, to get their buddy down to, to him. And that's, that's the same story that we have right here, this healing of the sick of the palsy. Um, so that's kind of the background. We need to understand this is the same story. Verse, verse, uh, verse two, behold, they brought the man sick of the palsy lying on the bed and then seeing their faith. Would you note that, that he saw the four buddies' faith? Um, I think that there's something about standing with someone in faith, you know, that helps build faith. Like faith encourages faith. And um, I think that there's something, if you're with cancer, um, having friends and Christians around you that also have faith and, and trust that Jesus knows what he's doing. Uh, there's something about that. And I like that Jesus saw their faith. Don't, don't ever sell that short, that when you're, when you're in a situation of real, real need, that having other Christians around you, don't have to be the Lone Ranger. There's something that is faith upon faith that sort of helps build each other's faith. I think faith is contagious. And that's kind of what's going on here. So seeing their faith, the four, the four buddies um, said unto the sick of the palsy, son, uh, son, uh, son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven. Jesus says, be of good cheer. One of these days we'll do a, a sermon on the, the be of good cheer statements because Jesus says this often, you know, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. And st another storm we'll talk about. Um, you know, there's, there's so many cool times where Jesus said, be of good cheer. And this is one of them. And, you know, at first you think, well, there's nothing to be cheerful about. They just tore a hole in a roof and now their buddy's there and he's still sick of the palsy. But Jesus understands what the real need of this guy is. And it's not that he stand up and walk, that his sins be forgiven. So he says, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Oh, when people learn this truth, it's profound. I think one of my favorite parts of baptism is to remind people in the water, there's something about being in the waters of baptism. There's, it's a powerful moment in your life. And if you've not been baptized, you're missing out on not only a great event that's in your Christian walk, but it also is an empowering, I think the spirit came upon Jesus in his baptism. And that's when he started doing miracles. I see when a person gets baptized, that's often the launching point of a person's ministry and serving the Lord kind of to the next level. Um, but one of the things I love about baptism is that when, when I can firmly remind someone that your sins are forgiven. And it's not that I have the power to forgive sins, um, but Jesus died on the cross so that the sins of the world might be forgiven. And, and, and Jesus is the only one who has the authority to say your sins be forgiven. But he, he says it to this guy, and guess what? He says it to you. If you've repented of your sins, and if you've turned to Christ and accepted Jesus on the cross, you, you, you get the same word, be of good cheer, your sins be forgiven thee. And, and when a person comes to that realization for real, it's easy to say, yeah, yeah, your sins are forgiven. But when you get to that moment, there's something about the water of baptism, the reality of that often sinks into a person. And, and if I could just tell you, I don't even know how to articulate this, but when you make that clear at baptism, you can almost see a spiritual weight lift off people's shoulders when they realize, man, my sins really are forgiven. And he remembers my sins no more. And he puts my sins as far as the East is from the West. Man, that's the Lord. And uh, you get that sense that there was a heavy weightiness to Jesus telling this guy, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. Meanwhile, um, what happens here? Well, it goes on and says, and behold, um, certain of the, uh, of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemeth. <laughs> um, interesting that, that they, they, um, they uh, say that he's blaspheming. Um, Actually, Jesus is, is being kind and loving and doing what Jesus only can do, forgiving sins. And, 
And uh, I, I love it. You know, what's blasphemous? Be of good cheer or your sins are forgiven. Like, it's really, it's really troublesome. What they're seeing is that Jesus is saying that, you know, he's making himself equal to God because they believed that only God had power to forgive sins. Um, man, what a, what a cool thing. By the way, on this be of good cheer part, don't forget to be of good cheer. And even when you're depressed, you've got to remember that Jesus forgave you of your sins. It's that whole, remember the Tiener Plep thing that we talk about once in a while? What's Tiener Plep? I saw a license plate the other day, Tiener Plep. I was like, that's awesome. Um, and what's Tiener Plep? Well, it's a word that uh, my dad used to tell us and we'd talk about when we were kids. Uh, you, you know, you're angry or sad or depressed, better Tiener Plep those thoughts. And what's Tiener Plep? T-N-R-P-L-A-E-P. What's that stand for? Well, it goes to Philippians 4.8. And um, in Philippians 4, 8, one of the things you have to remember is um, what we're supposed to think about and not dwell on bad things and negative things. But instead, he says, finally, and here's where the teener plop comes in. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is T, true. Um, whatever is noble, T-N. Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, um, uh, uh, whatever, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, um, think about such things, it says here. And um, so if you put all these together, if you have the NIV, I think the King James is go with a hmm. Um, so the, the word doesn't work very good, but in the NIV, it's teeter plap. And, uh, and so you, mom and dad, you gotta remember, remind your kids, kids, you gotta teeter plap those thoughts. Well, what does that mean? Think about what, what's, what's actually true. I've noticed that a lot of times when, when you're, um, depressed and thinking about how bad things are, most of what you're thinking about has nothing to do with reality. So you gotta start thinking, well, what's actually true? Everybody hates me. Well, uh, that's probably not true. Just most people. No, I'm just kidding. No, actually, um, very few people probably actually hate you. That's the truth. What is true? What's noble? Oh man, you gotta think about what's noble. Um, what does noble mean? You gotta look it up in the dictionary. Now, you know, uh, what is right, pure, lovely, ad admirable, excellent, praiseworthy? These are the things you're supposed to think on. So, so I love that Jesus is that kind of a guy. He'd come in and say, be of good cheer. Well, I can't be of good cheer because I'm depressed. Jesus didn't give room for that. He said, just don't be of good cheer. Cheer up is what he'd say. So, um, so um, he says, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven thee here. And, and, um, and this is why these guys are gonna react because um, they, they don't think anybody has the power except for God to forgive sins. So verse three, it says, and behold, certain of the scribes within them, said within themselves, this man blasphemeth. Um, they're thinking this to themselves. And Jesus knowing their thoughts said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts. <laughs> now Jesus, of course, knowing their thoughts because he's miraculous and he knows what's in their brains, but you know, as a guy who speaks a lot, I've noticed that sometimes you can tell what's in people's brains when you're speaking. Like there's times that I, I say things here and I notice people are disgusted. So, Sunday morning, some of you guys see it too. They just get up and march out. Have you ever seen the people that get out and they march out with a, kind of a high step? It's kind of like, <laughs> and they get up, they hear me say something. And I'm like, I know what you're thinking. You, you think the snowy plover is more important than a human being. <laughs> Um, you know, or you think, that, you know, there's people that have certain thoughts and they're, and they're thinking to themselves, well, I don't like what that guy's saying. And so when I, when I see that, and, I'm, and I'm, especially if it's just something I'm sharing from the scripture, if it's a story about a wedding that offends you, then, then I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said it. But if it's a story about Jesus here that offends you, that's, that's on you. But people get up offended by the Bible. And, um, and so there's comfort for me and there should be for you. When people reject what you're teaching from the Bible, um, realize that they were rejecting Jesus. Um, Jesus said something beautiful here. Be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven thee. And there's people in their hearts going, who does he think he is, that blasphemer? Uh, that, that actually brings comfort to realize that they even thought Jesus was, was wrong. Um, well, in verse four, knowing their thoughts, he said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk. Which one's, you know, which one's easier? Um, Jesus asked this, by the way, rhetorically. He's not really looking for a, uh, an answer. He, the answer is obviously, wow, it's, it's, it's easier to say, arise and take your bed and walk. That's easy. But to forgive sins, well, that's difficult. Uh, how difficult? Just, just read the narrative of the cross. God became a man lived among us a perfect life, sinless, and went to the cross and died 
on the cross for the sins of the whole world. Like that, that, was, that was the hardest thing that ever happened on the earth. But fortunately, he was able to do it. So it is more difficult to say your sins are forgiven. Um, it's not just a spoken word. It's the greatest deed ever done on the earth. The idea of forgiving of sin. Um, Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. How could he say this? Um, you know, which, which is harder? You, you, you almost think, well, this is a little bit out of order. Jesus hadn't died yet. So how does everybody know this? Well, you gotta understand Revelation 13, eight reminds us that um, this is something that was before the foundation of the earth. Revelation 13, eight says, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Interesting last phrase there. Jesus the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Um, what does that mean? Well, there was a time in history on earth Jesus died on the cross, but he would be known as the slain lamb of God even before the foundation was set. That's kind of an interesting idea there. But back to verse five, um, for he says, which one's easier to forgive or to say arise and, and take up your bed? Um, but verse six, it says, um, but that you may know that the son of man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up thy bed and go to thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Isn't that something? Wow, and they glorified God. Now, should they glorify Jesus? You could and you should. But see, these people aren't really sure exactly what to think about this yet. They're not glorifying Jesus yet, which is okay because Jesus is God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, I always do that which pleases the Father. So J Jesus here, uh, even though we know Jesus is God, this still prompted people to worship the Father in heaven, which he's fulfilling all righteousness. I would say it's like when he got baptized. Did he need to get baptized? Um, no, because he hadn't sinned, but yes, he got baptized because he was to fulfill all righteousness. In the same way as he heals this guy and the people are glorifying God, um, you know, we see this as a fulfilling of righteousness. Um, remember what we learned way back in chapter five in the Sermon on the Mount, where it says, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Jesus is modeling for us what, what we should be doing. If, if some, the Lord uses you in any way, shape or form, whether it's uh, preaching a sermon or praying for a sick person who gets healed, um, the goal should always be glorifying the Father, which is in heaven. Jesus is doing that perfectly here. Um, if you happen to do anything great in your life, be careful, don't try to take the credit for it. Uh, Jesus models that. He could have taken the credit, but he didn't. Uh, you and I can't and we shouldn't. Um, so there it is. Well, um, so uh, they, they go away glorifying God that God had given power to such uh, men and, and he didn't, you say, well, Brett, he gave it to, to Jesus, who's God. But do you understand that the Lord allows us to have gifts of healing um, given to people in, in the church? If, if, if you're a person who prays for someone and they're sick, that same healing power by the Holy Spirit, it's not through you or in you, but it's, it's a gift given to you. When people say, I have the gift of healing, they don't. They were given a gift of healing for that moment. That, that's, there's a syntax. We'll get to that in a few weeks when we get to 1 Corinthians 12 when we talk about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Um, healing is real and powerful, um, but uh, people misattribute their gifts. Uh, Romans 12 are the motivational gifts people literally have, gifts. First Corinthians 12 is, they're called gifts, but they're actually manifestations of the Holy Spirit. The word gifts is in italics in First Corinthians 12, which means that we're not talking really about gifts. We're talking about manifestations of what the Holy Spirit does. And one of the things the Holy Spirit does is he'll give a manifestation of healing through any one of you. Any one of you that wanna pray for someone who's sick, as you pray in faith, say, Lord, I know you're able to do exceeding abundantly what I, above what I'd ask or think, and you're able to heal this cold or this cancer or whatever it is, as you pray, the Lord may give through you a gift of healing to that person. That's, that's the language really of the Bible. Um, the reason I say that is you're like, I'm no Benny Hinn, I don't have the gift of healing. Well, neither does he but you actually do have access to the power that heals. And that's God working by his spirit through you. Don't be afraid to pray for people uh, when they're sick. And, um, and, and then we leave it the rest to the Lord uh, if he's gonna heal that person 
or not. We'll see people that Jesus doesn't heal in the gospel narrative. And we'll, uh, we'll see that as we keep going through. Uh, I'm not gonna push through any further because it's late and I wanna make sure and take our time as we go through these great stories of Jesus. So let's close in prayer. Lord, how thankful we are for um, this great gospel narrative, Lord. We want more of Jesus, more in our lives, more of you, Lord, and help us to learn how to be more like him. Um, I pray, Lord, that we'd be those that when good things happen from us, Lord, that, that like Jesus, that people would give glory to God the Father, you, Lord, that, that it wouldn't be glory on us, not unto us, but unto thy name. Receive glory and honor, Lord, like the psalmist said in 115. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless us, that, that Lord, we'd have uh, great faith to trust that you can work in us and through us. Lord, um, help us not to forget that same um, power that we see in your son, Jesus. Um, Lord, that we get, to, we get to be a part of that. Lord, we, we acknowledge that we're nowhere near, or we're not even measured in the class of Jesus. Um, but it's amazing, Lord, you choose to use weak and foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So Lord, we, we do pray as we learn more of Jesus, help us to have his attitude, his heart, his mind. Lord, help us to be more like him, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And we'll see you next time. God bless you. You're dismissed.